sing it with us. If you have a Bible today, I want to invite you to turn with me to Proverbs 17 this morning. Proverbs 17. I want to welcome you to read two of our series called Maximize. The word maximize simply means to make as large or great as possible to make the best use of. And so in this series, what we are doing, uh, we are looking to the Word of God to discover how we can maximize our relationships. I think all of us desire relationships uh, to be great. We want them to be as great as possible. Uh, we want our relationships, really, we want to make the best use of the relationships that we have with others. And, and so that's the focus of this series. We are looking to God's Word together to find out what we need to do to maximize our relationship. The question that we are asking throughout this series is this question. It's not, it's not this question. It's not how can I get the most out of my relationships, but the question we're asking is, how can I give the most to the relationships that I have with others? And so last week, we kind of, we really kind of took a, a really broad look at the whole uh, subject, and we, we just really discovered how to maximize our relationship with others. But today, we're going to narrow the focus just a little bit, and we're going to discover how to maximize our relationship with friends. And so, if you would, in honor of reading God's Word, stand with me one final time. <laughs> Proverbs 17, verse 17, it says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Father, we ask that you would open up our hearts to receive your word. Help us to be the kind of friend that you would have us to be. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible has always claimed that it's best to travel with others. In Genesis 2.18, we find God saying something that he had never said before. On the sixth day of creation, God creates man. And after doing so, the Bible tells us that he says it's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. Now, up until that point, he had said, it's good, it's good, it's good. And then he saw man all alone, all by himself, and, and he said, this is not good. And so, very early in the Bible... Now, we discover a warning from God that trying to live life in, in isolation is not good for us. In the verse I just read, the Bible tells us that a brother is born for adversity. In other words, when we experience adversity in this life, and we all experience adversity in this life, and none of us are immune to adversity, it's going to happen. And the Bible says that, that when that happens, it's beneficial to have a friend stand shoulder to shoulder with us to help us overcome. In fact, if we want to know who our true friends are, all we have to do is look around to see who is there for us in times of adversity. And we'll know. Fairweather friends are not really friends. The Bible says that a friend loves at all times. And so fair weather friends are not really friends. It is those who are with us through all of life's weather. It's those people who are truly our friends. And friends are important. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, verses 9 and 10, two are better than one. For if either one of them falls, and again, we do fall. All of us occasionally fall, not just physically, but we fall. We stumble along life's way. The Bible says the one will lift up his companion. And I, all of us have had people in our life who were there, and they, they lifted us. They helped us up when we, when we have fallen. The Bible says, woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. The Bible is always claimed 
that, it's, that it is best to travel the road of life with friends. And interestingly, science is starting to say what the Bible has always, has always said. Friendships are important. I want you to listen to this. Alameda County did a, did a nine-year study of 700 people. And what they discovered as a result of the study is that isolated people are three times more likely to die than people who are relationally connected. Furthermore, they discovered relationally connected people with bad health habits. I don't know if that's anybody here. Still live longer than isolated people with great health habits. So let me summarize this study for you best I can. And I'll put it up on the screen, give you a visual. It is better to eat Hertz donuts with friends than it is to eat broccoli all by yourself. That's what that study's telling us. The American Medical Association Journal did a study on illness and what they discovered as a result of this study is that those who had deeper relationships were four times better at fighting off the virus that causes the common cold. Furthermore, they discovered that even when those who, when those who had deep relationships did catch a cold, they were less contagious and produced less mucus. And so let me summarize this study for you best I can. <laughs> friendly people are less snotty than unfriendly people. <laughs> Now, I want to tell you, you just Google snotty noses sometimes, and I'll tell you what, I, there were some images I could have put up, and I spared you today, I didn't want to put up, because I know my wife would have had a conversation with me on the way home. So I left it at that. But friendly people are less snotty than unfriendly people. And so friendships are important. They are very important. The Bible has always argued this fact in science is now agreeing with this biblical fact. So here's the question I want us to consider today. Okay, this is the heart. Here's the question. Do you have a few close Christian friends? Do you have a few close Christian friends? Now, in order to best answer this question, here's what we're going to do. We're going to break down this question by focusing on some key words. So first... Let's ask this. Do you have a few friends? Do you have a few friends? Some of you might be sitting there thinking, I don't just have a few friends, Travis. I mean, I have, I have hundreds of friends. I mean, in fact, if you were, if you were to look at my address book, if you were to, if you were to look at, at the contact list on my phone, you would see that I know a lot of people. Well, that's great, but the question isn't, do you know a lot of people? The question is, do you have a few friends? friends. See, I think so often we confuse acquaintances as friends. Acquaintances are people that we have, con that we have contact with in life. But friends are people we stay in contact with in life. Now, it is possible to have hundreds of, of acquaintances. And, and again, many in this room, you have hundreds of acquaintances. But it's not possible to have hundreds of friends. It's just not possible. And the reason is simple. Friendship requires time. And we only have so much time to give. I mean, friends do things together. That requires time. Friends talk with each other. This requires time. Friends help each other. This requires time. And so friendship really is all about being there for one another, and that requires time. And all of us, I mean, we only have so much time to give. And so if we're truly going to be a friend, we can only be a friend to a few people. I want you to listen to what Proverbs 18.24 says. A man of too many friends comes to ruin. And now some say that a person can never have too many friends. Have you ever heard that? He never have too many friends. Well, Proverbs 8, 24, 18, 24 says, a man of too many friends comes to ruin. It says a man of too many friends comes to ruin. You see, to call ourselves a friend of someone requires that we show ourselves to be a friend. And here's the deal. 
To show ourselves a friend, we have to give our time. And when we give our time to too many people, it will ruin us in many ways. One of which is our reputation will be ruined. You see, when we try to be a friend to everyone, we will end up being a friend to no one. And that's, that's just the reality. In fact, I like how the Amplified Version puts it in, in Proverbs 18. For the man of many friends, a friend of all the world, will prove himself a bad friend. You know, Jesus only had a few friends. He did. Jesus only had a few friends. If you were to, if you were to study the life of Jesus, you will notice that he had three circles of relationships. He had a public circle. He had a personal circle. And he had a private circle. You can see there on the screen the public circle. That I mean, really, the public circle included the multitude. But then he had a personal circle, and this included the 12 disciples. It included uh, people like Mary and Martha and Lazarus. But then he had this inner circle, this private circle. So even the 12 disciples were narrowed down to three. And that three was Peter, James, and John. Evidence that these three were among Jesus' closest friends is seen in several places in the Bible, and I want to share them with you. First of all, Matthew 17, it says, Six days later... Jesus took, took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And so Jesus went at the, the Mount of Transfiguration. He didn't take all 12 up there. He took three. He took the three closest to him. He took Peter, and he took James. And he took John. And then in Matthew 26, we find Jesus. He, he takes his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. His soul is overwhelmed with the thought of, of Calvary's cross that is awaiting him. So he goes to the Garden to pray. And he takes his disciples with him. However, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John a little bit further into the Garden than everyone else. Listen to what the Bible tells us in Matthew 26. Beginning in verse 36, it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And then he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and began to be grieved and distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And so clearly the Bible teaches that Jesus didn't have a multitude of friends. Jesus had a few friends. And so, again, the question is, do you have a few friends? Now, again, all of us, we have a public circle. We have personal circle of relationships. But do you have that inner circle? Do you have a few friends? Now, let's ask this question. Do you have a few Christian friends? <coughs> Do you have a few Christian friends? The last question might have been really easy for some of us to answer. I mean, when we, when we look at our lives, we can easily identify that we have a few friends. But now we transition from the quantity of friends <coughs> to the quality of friends that we have. See, this is where the question might become a little difficult for some of us. As we, as we look at the few friends that we have, some of us might have to admit that, that the friends that we have in our, in our inner circle do not bring out the best of Christ in us. But rather, they bring out the worst of the world in us. You see, the reality is that we become like those that we are closest to. The people that we spend the most time with are going to be the ones that have the most influence on us. I mean, the people that we rub shoulders with most often, are they going to rub off on us. And that's just the reality of life. And so, if we spend the most time with people who are not Christians, or are Christians in name only, what's going to happen? It's going to, be, it's going to prove to be harmful to our spiritual growth because God can't use them to sharpen us. I want you to hear what the Bible says in Proverbs 27, 17. Iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another. God wants those closest to us to sharpen us, to be more effective for him. But only iron will sharpen iron. Butter won't sharpen iron. 
You ever tried that? I'll, here, here's a challenge today. I want you to go home, and I want you to try to sharpen iron with butter. Come back next week and report to us. If anybody was able to sharpen iron with butter, you know what you witnessed? A miracle. <laughs> That's what you witnessed. Because butter doesn't sharpen iron. Wood, what's wood going to do? Wood's going to go on. I mean, you think about an axe. <clears throat> Chopping wood, what, what eventually happens? Does it sharpen it? No, it dulls the axe, so then the, the axe has to be sharpened, doesn't it? But not by wood. See, the reality is that if those friends closest to us are not Christians, they will end up dueling, dueling our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and stunting our spiritual growth. If you want to get a glimpse of your future, just, just look around at your closest friends because our closest friends help shape our future. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 20, he who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. If you want to have a wise future, if you want your future to be filled with wisdom, guess what kind of people you need to walk with in life? Guess who needs to be closest to you? Wise people. If, if, you, want your, if you want your future to be, to be filled with foolishness, listen, there's, there's a way to have that happen. Just have those closest to you be foolish people. And, and I, I promise you, they'll influence you. They'll help shape your future to that end. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. You know, so often we think, no, it won't happen to me. I mean, those closest to me, they can be, I mean, they can be the world's worst people. And they will not have a, an influence on my life. So what the Bible says. And I think God knows better than any of us. And so he warns us. He warns us very clearly. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. It doesn't say it might. It says it will. It's certain to happen. Now, some of you have got to be sitting there thinking, I'm a little confused, Pastor. I mean, I mean I'm not supposed to have any friends that are not Christians. I mean, is that what you're telling me? I'm not saying that. I mean, Jesus, he did have a reputation of being a friend of sinners, right? Yes. <coughs> Jesus spent time with sinners, and, and so should we. And you'll never hear me say otherwise. But do you know where they were found within the circle of relationships that Jesus had? Were they in the inner circle? No. No. They might have been in a private circle or in a multitude of a public circle, but they were not in that circle that was closest to him. Jesus spent time with sinners. He did. We should never isolate ourselves from sinners. That's not what this message is about. In fact, this message is all about helping us be more effective, more sensitive. Whereas when we are with sinners, we will be strong and be able to be a witness to them instead of not being a witness to them. And it's all about having those friends close in our lives that will help us accomplish that. But he spent the most time with Peter and James and John. And so in no way is this suggesting that we shouldn't spend time with sinners. It's merely suggesting. And I want you to hear this today. If we're going to effectively influence sinners, we have to have a few Christians that are close to us. that keep are spiritually sharp. To have the most spiritual impact. So here's the question. Do you have a few friends? Do you have a few Christian friends? Final question. Do you have a few close Christian friends? Do you have a few close Christian friends? See, it's great to have a few Christian friends. But it's even greater to have a few close Christian friends. Our Christian friends can only be of help to us when we let them get close enough to actually help us in this journey called life. You know, friends do a lot for us. 
A few close Christian friends will do a lot of this. First of all, they'll, they'll carry our heavy burdens. I wonder if there's anybody sitting in this room you, you, you've ever had a heavy burden. I wonder if there's anybody sitting in this room do you have a heavy burden today? Do you know what a close Christian friend will do for you? They'll help you carry that heavy burden. I don't know how many of you, I can't tell by looking, and I certainly don't want to make any assumptions, if any of you lift weights, some of you kind of buff. You, you might do it. How many of you, at least at one time in your life, lifted weights? <coughs> Come on, be proud. I remember weightlifting in high school. We would do it as a football team and basketball team. You'd sit there and you'd, you know, you'd get ready to do you know, bench press. I was always amazed. I mean, there was always somebody close to me. You know what they call them? Spotter. Call them a spotter. I mean, I thought, I thought, I don't, I don't know why. I'm always trying to lift five pounds here. I'm always trying to lift <laughs> But that spot was right there. You get that, you're bench pressing, you're lifting it. Why is that spotter there? He's not, he's not off somewhere in the distance, he's right there close. Why? Because if the heavy burden becomes too much for you, they're right there to help you carry the load, to carry the heavy burden. Spotter, they can see when you're struggling. They can see that you need help because they're close enough to see it. We need Christian friends who are close enough. So should we ever start struggling under the weight of a heavy burden, they are within reach to help carry the heavy burden. We need those kind of people in our life. I mean, physically we need it when we're lifting weights. How much more do we need it when we go through this life that is filled with one heavy burden after another? And sometimes, I don't know about you, but I mean, sometimes I, I'm almost crushed by the weight of heavy burdens. There's times where, I, where I, I'm like, man, I'm so, I'm, I'm so discouraged, and, 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 I, and I wonder if, if, if things are ever going to be any better. And thank God that there's somebody close enough, and they can see that I'm struggling, and they come along and they say, Travis, it's going to be okay. I'm going to help carry this burden with you. And we all need those kind of people in our lives. And so they, they help us carry heavy words, but listen, close Christian friends, they also help us see what we can't see. Blind spots. They help us see what we can't. I don't know if your vehicle has any blind spots, but our vehicle does. And as a result, there are times when, when I can't see something, but Melissa can and so sometimes as we're driving along, I have to ask Melissa if there's anything coming that I can't see. You know, we need Christian friends riding shotgun with us in our spiritual life. Because the reality is that all of us have spiritual blind spots. All of us have things that we can't see. And so we need somebody who's there, who's close. There are things, listen, in life that we can't see coming at us in life that those close to us can. And so we need these Christian friends riding shotgun next to us in this journey of life so that we can turn to them and we can ask them, is there anything you see coming in my finances or my health or my schedule or my marriage that I don't see that could wreck my life or someone else? You see, the truth is that most spectacular failures in life are not a result of one fatal choice, but rather a series of undetected, unchallenged choices. That's a reality. These spectacular failures in life that we've all witnessed and maybe we've been a part of, they're not a result of one fatal choice, but rather a series of undetected, unchallenged choices. And so we need 
close Christian friends to challenge our choices when they need to be challenged. I, I want you to, if you have your Bible, turn over. This, this was just as I was meditating on this message last night. Another verse that the, the Lord gave me was Proverbs 27. Verses 5 and 6. Don't you hear what it says? Better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds we need people who love us enough and they see something that we can't see. Something that will wreck our lives. Something that will wreck other people's lives. They're not willing to say, you know what, I'm going to let this slide by. But they will, they will wound us. They will confront us. They will challenge us with those choices. We need those people because that's true love. It's not really love when you see something in somebody's life and you know the end result is going to cause so much pain and so much heartache and so much devastation, maybe not just to them, but other people around them. You say, well, I know what's going to happen, but you know what? I'm, I'm just not going to say anything. They'll just have to find out for themselves. That's not a friend. That's not a close Christian friend. We need people close enough who will say, you know what, Travis? I see this in your life. And this is not healthy. This is not good. And if left alone, it's going gonna, it's gonna to wreck your life. And we need people like that. But here's the deal. Not everybody can do that, right? Not everybody can do that in our life. But those people who are close to us, those people who have proven themselves to be true friends, those people who are in that inner circle, they have the right to do that someday. They've earned that right. They've earned that right by being there for us. They've earned that right by, by being trustworthy throughout different seasons of our life. And so we say, you know what? I trust you. I consider you to be a person who's wise. And I will certainly take that into consideration. But listen, to have these close relationships, these close friendships, it requires vulnerability. We've got to be vulnerable. We've got to take off the mask every once in a while and say, you know what? You're right. You're right. I'm glad that you can see it. I mean, I've been, I've been able to fool a lot of people that's, that's kind of in my private circle and my public circle, but, but you're close to me and, and you can see through the mask. So we've got to be vulnerable. We've got to be teachable. We've got to be teachable. We've got to be willing to, to listen and learn from those who are closest to us. It requires availability. I mean, right? I mean, people have to get it. It's all about time. And we all know where our culture is on time. But, but listen, we need to have time for people in our, in our close Christian circle of friends. And certainly it, it requires confidentiality. I mean, what, what, what is said in that, in that inner circle, it stays in that inner circle. It doesn't go beyond the inner circle. It's there. And, and again, it requires so you've got to know these people and you've got to trust these people whereas you're willing to say, you know what? I wouldn't to allow you to be that kind of friend in my life. So after breaking all down, we're now back to the original question. Do you have a few close Christian friends? If you can say yes to that today, I want you to understand the treasure that you have. I want you to understand the treasure that you have in this life. Don't. Don't. You need those kind of people in your life. And if you don't have those kind of people in your life, I would urge you and challenge you and encourage you best I know have. Find those kind of friends. Don't try to do it by yourself. You're not strong enough. You're not big enough. You're not wise enough. And guess what? You're in good company. Because I'm not. <coughs> and neither, neither is the person sitting next to you. None of us are. And God knew that. And so that's why he tells us in his word as we go throughout this life on this life journey that we make sure we have close Christian friends. You know those people back in high school who called you friends? 
You remember, you remember how said, oh, these people are going to be my friends forever. You know, some of them even say that graduation. Oh, friends are friends forever. You should lay it back and forth. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> was the last time you talked to them? Was the last time you checked in on them? They're not friends. But there are those people who have come along since high school. And they are closer to you. People ever in high school. So listen, if you don't have a close any close Christian friends, pray. Pray and ask God to bring you into relationships where you can have that, that inner circle of friends. Because it's important. Jesus Christ, and I close with this, he demonstrated for us what real friendship looks like. He did. John 15, verses 12 and 13 says, This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus did. That's exactly what he did. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ, he died for us. See, Jesus, he maximized the relationship for our benefit. He took our place on the cross. He died for our sin. And Jesus Christ, he, he wants to have a relationship with you. He laid down his life so he could have a relationship with you. And if, if you're here today and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation, I want you to understand, first of all, all of us, again, we're all in the same boat here. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible makes that very clear. The Bible tells us very clearly that, that the wage of sin is death, but it doesn't end there. It says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So you have to come to this place where you have to admit, yes, I've sinned, and my sin is, is deserving of death, but, but Jesus Christ took my place. The, the, the punishment that I deserve, Jesus took on the cross. He shed his blood so that I could be forgiven of my sin and then simply confess Jesus to be your Savior, that Jesus alone is the one who can save you. And if you're here today and you've never done that, I want to invite you to do that. I want to ask that everybody just close their eyes, bow their heads. If you're here today and, and, and the Holy Spirit is just speaking your heart and you know you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, but you know you've sinned, and you know that Jesus died for you. And today you want to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Would you just right where you're at? Would you turn your pew into an altar? Would you just say this? Jesus, I know I've sinned. I know that my sin is deserving of death. But Jesus, I believe that you came to this earth. That you took my place on the cross. That you died for me. That you shed your blood for me so that I could be forgiven of my sins. I believe that you were placed in a tomb. But three days later, you arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. And today, I confess you as my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for loving me enough to lay down your life. I pray, Jesus, that I would lay down my life for you. And that I would lay down my life for my friends. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you just prayed that prayer for the very first time, I'm going to ask you to do something. Nobody's looking. It's just me and you and the Lord. Would you just look up your hand right where you're at? Anybody who would say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer for the very first time. Anybody at all? In just a few moments, Brian is going to lead us in a song. It's simply an invitation. An invitation to respond to anything that the Lord may, may have been saying to you before you even got here. Maybe he's been speaking to you this past week. And you got here and he's still speaking to you. And you just need to come to these altars and you just need to make whatever it is right. I just want to encourage you to be obedient to whatever God's showing you to do. Father, Thank you for speaking to us through your word. Help us now to act. Help us to act upon your word. To do what you're calling us to do during this time of invitation. Father, I believe decisions need to be made. 
because you always call us to make decisions as we hear your word. And so I pray that we would make those decisions even now. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here. We love you. We thank you for laying down your life for us, Jesus. And may we lay down our life right now in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand and sing, would you come right now? Don't wait. I have decided.